chapter 7, you know, as we're making our way through the book of Psalms, of course, we, you know, we're going through that first book, and what you're going to see is a lot, it seems like it's just a lot of the same thing. It's David, you know, pleading for the Lord against his enemies, praying to God for his deliverance, and, and, and that's because that is what's going on in, in, this, in, these, in these, uh, these chapters that we're working our way through. And, you know, we should never go, oh, you know, here's another one where it's kind of the same thing over and over and get bored or think that it's just being redundant. We have to remember that David, you know, he was going through a very serious time of affliction in his life. I mean, if you were being hunted down by, uh, you know, somebody who you had respected, somebody who you had, you know, tried to be helped to, as he did with, 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 uh, with uh, Saul, you know, you would probably write similar psalms. It probably wouldn't be just something that, you know, you sat down and wrote a journal entry and got it off your chest and that was it. And then, pursue, you know, went on to continue being pursued in the wilderness and everything that David went through. So whenever you're reading the Psalms and you think, oh man, David's just going on and on. It's not because, you know, he's weak or he's soft or he's just, you know, complaining. It's because we have to understand that he was, the type of uh, tribulation that he was going through, the anguish of his soul that he was going through. You know, we've probably never really experienced anything quite like it. I'm sure we've all had trials and temptations in our life, but I, I don't know, has anyone here been, you know, hunted down in the wilderness? Has anyone have had to leave and forsake, you know, their families and leave their homeland and just wander around out in the wilderness, not knowing what was going to happen and have, you know, some high authority chasing you with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men, you know, chosen men for war that are trying to kill you. So don't ever, as we're going through these chapters, I know we're just in, you know, chapter seven. Don't ever think, oh, it's just more of the same. You know, it is more of the same, but it's for a reason. You know, there's a lot of meaning behind it. So I just got to mention that as we're kind of getting into the book, uh, the, 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 the book of Psalms here. But in Psalm 7, it starts out there. If, if most Bibles, I'd assume everybody has it. If not, you know, it has that title before it really gets into the first verse. It says, Shagayan of David, which he's saying unto the Lord concerning the words of Cush the Benjamite. And just that alone is kind of an interesting thing. You'll see that uh, that phrase, that uh, type of titling so often. Uh, you know, the Shagayim of David, or you know, sometimes I'm, I'm forgetting the other ones that are that he uses. But you'll you'll see these type of phrases in there. And you do, uh, you know, Shigion, What is it? What does it mean? Is not completely clear. We don't know what that means uh, exactly. I think we can have a pretty good, educated guess at what it means. I think that what I personally think is that it means it is a prayer that is sung. You know, and it's interesting that this comes up because I was actually talking to somebody about this recently. They mentioned it. And uh, if you would, and well, you don't have to go there. I'll just read to you. But the same phrase is kind of used in Habakkuk, which is, uh, you know, one of the minor prophets. It says a prayer of Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1, upon Shigano, which is kind of a similar phrase. And now, the, now some people speculate and say, well, it's, you know, is this uh, Shigion, is this, or Shigion, however you say it, or Shiganoth, as in Habakkuk, maybe this is a musical instrument, this could be, because you have to remember the book of Psalms is a book of songs, these are things that were sung, this is why they're written to, you know, the, music, the musician, or the, or the chief musician often, you'll see that phrase. So maybe it was a musical measure, you know, or... Something like that. But really what I think it is is that it just means that it was a prayer that was sung. This is just a prayer that was sung. And sometimes that might strike us as odd and might think, you know, prayer is one thing and singing is another. You know, but I, I believe that, you know, you can do both. You know, sometimes we can pray and, and worship to God and, you know, in that process we can do that in song. You know, we can sing. For example, we can sing these psalms to God. You know, and, and a lot of times what we'll find is, that we're actually praying, you know, that, like I was singing the one on the way down here. I can't remember what psalm it is, but it's, Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. You know, I'm singing that. I like the tune, but at the same time, I'm praying that in my heart, you know what? Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Amen. You know, let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a lot. That's scripture. Yeah. And I'm singing it, but I'm also praying that. You know, let God be true and let every man be a liar. Yeah. So you can see what David is doing here and why this idea, this concept of, you know, singing a prayer isn't so strange if it strikes us that way. 
And I, I believe that's, you know, what you see in Habakkuk. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shigunov. And then at the end of the chapter, it says, to the chief singer of my stringed instruments. So this was, I think, another, and if you read that chapter, it's, 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 it's Habakkuk, you know, pleading and imploring God, praying to the Lord. And I believe he's doing that in song. Because song, you know, is just a means of communication. That's all it really is. I mean, you can deliver a lot of messages through song. I mean, think about all the jingles that we have just sealed in our brains from our childhood. You know, I'm trying to think of fear. And I think I was just doing one the other day around the house. I can't remember which one it was, but I won't put you on the spot. You probably don't remember either. But I was walking around singing, I don't know, like, ba da ba ba da I'm the, you know, so that's probably not what it was. You know, the McDonald's one or, you know. You know, we could probably all go around the room and think of our favorite, you know, jingle that we heard, and we just, we just know it, you know, like the, and whatever we hear, just a Jurassic Park theme. I was doing that when I saw the guy that, you know, I don't know, it was about Tasonians in Jurassic Park. Every time, everyone has a Jeep Wrangler has to, like, I saw one was decked out like the, 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 the one from Jurassic Park with all the colors. And then I saw another one this morning. They had the wheel cover. It was Jurassic Park emblem. And I just instantly, you know, bum 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 ba da 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 You know it. You know. But that's just that's because music is so powerful. You know, because music is a means of communication. And that's something we have to really, you know, respect. Because of the fact that, you know, the devil uses that to his advantage. The devil is a is a musical being, I believe that. Or, you know, he's describing Isaiah as having, you know, tablets in his body that he was, you know, he, he has, he's a very musical creature. And uh, he knows the power of music. You know, God created music. That's God's invention. And God used it to, to glorify himself and to be worshipped. But the devil also can use it to deliver his message. You know, and, and, and I don't encourage it, but if you were to go out and listen to the worldly music and the message that they're delivering, you know, it's working. You know, people are people are hearing the message in the rock and roll culture, the hip hop culture, what you know, even the country music, you know, all of these different I mean some of the country music songs we don't think it's so wholesome. That's some of the sleaziest stuff you'll hear. Yeah. It's all about cheating on and getting drunk and everything other wicked thing that every other genre seems to be into. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I'm just gonna say, you know, whatever. <laughs> the point is you see people listen to that stuff. And then they get and they go out and live it, and they go, "Oh, that's what the song says, man. That's that's what I do, you know." And, uh, and music has a, a very strong way uh, to communicate a message, and, uh, and so it only makes sense that you know if we're trying to communicate with God and we want God to listen to what I say, maybe maybe song isn't a bad way to do that. You know, maybe singing a prayer isn't such a bad way to do that. You know, sing. You can even pray the Psalms. I believe that. I believe in praying the Scripture. You know, sometimes if you're going through something, reading a Scripture, just praying that. You know, finding a you know a passage. You know, I, I've known people that do this when they're going through a difficult time, when they're scared, when they're, you know, whatever, when they're anxious. They'll find songs or uh, excuse me, Psalms or verses in the Bible about you know the peace of God. The, you know, the, the, the pieces that pass with all understanding, and they'll just recite these scriptures. And what, what are they doing? Are they just, is it just, they're just, you know, rote memory? No, what they're doing, whether they realize it or not, is they're praying those passages. They're praying the promises of God. They're praying the promises of scripture to the Lord. And it often, you know, works, brings them peace and comfort. Now, song, of course, uh, is something that we're supposed to do today. And even as New Testament Christians, if you want to go over to Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, it's important that we understand this because there are some people or some denominations, I believe Church of Christ is one of them, that will tell you, you know, we shouldn't have any musical instruments in church, which is ridiculous. When you have, you have the book of Psalms where David is just saying, you know, praise God on the cymbal and the high sounding cymbal and the psaltery on the harp, on the string instruments, on the instrument of ten strings, just the instrument after instrument after instrument. He's talking about using musical instruments to praise God. And then we're supposed to get in the New Testament and just drop all that and not use musical instruments anymore. Oh. <clears throat> the Bible says, you're going over to Colossians and Ephesians, uh, to, to not be drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then, you know, and, and people have some confusing ideas about what it means to be filled with the Spirit or how to get the filling of the Spirit. I mean, go, go into the Pentecostal churches today. 
and see what they think their take on that. Oh, you know, if you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to flop around the floor like a fish. You know, you're going to run up and down the aisles, and you're going to let Benny Hinn slap you in the in the back with, a, with a, his jacket or something like that. You know, it, it's crazy. You're going to shake and, and gyrate and vibrate all over the place, and they have a very. And they'll say, "Well, that person's just filled with the Spirit." Well, they're filled with a Spirit, or they're faking it, or who knows what's going on. But the Bible tells us how to be filled with the Spirit, and it's not just it's not this you know this mystical you know thing that we have to kind of figure out and. And wonder about what does it take to be filled with the Spirit? You know, God wants, I mean, think about it. Does God want us to be filled with the Spirit? Of course He does. Amen. You know, it's a command. God's not going to say, command us to do something and say, now you figure out how to do that. You know, God commands us to be filled with the Spirit, and then He gives us a very good way of doing that. He says, and you're, I know you're in Colossians, but I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, Be not drunk with wine and wherein is ex excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it says, hey, be filled with the Spirit. And then it's not a coincidence that he goes on in that same sentence and says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody and, and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know, I believe that that is a great way to get filled with the Spirit. Because, I mean, what is it to be filled with the Spirit? It means to have the fruits of the Spirit. You're, you're, if you're filled with the Spirit, you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to have the, the, the love, joy, long-suffering, you know, patience, meekness, all these things that are, that are the fruits of the Spirit. And, if, you know, one way to get that is through song and, you know, singing and making melody in your heart. You know, and, and I believe that's why the Scripture is such a great meaning to maybe put together my own little song sheet. I remember my old church, we used to have several psalms. And I know we do that here. We have psalms here that we sing that, that, are, that are unique um, to the melody and all that, unique to us that we've written. Um, but uh, that's a great way, I think, to get filled with the Spirit. And it's amazing how it can change your attitude. It really can. I mean, you can be having a bad day, and if you just kind of force yourself into a, a good spiritual song or a hymn or something like that, man, it really can change your, your whole attitude. It can remind you of some things that you have going for you. You know, if you're feeling down and, you know, you're feeling like, like we could sing those songs we sang tonight. You know, boy, every, you know, it seems like everyone's turning their back on me. I don't have any friends. Well, great is thy faithfulness. Okay. You know, maybe we messed up, you know, well, you know, thy, thy mercies are new every morning. You know, in, in morning by new morning, new mercies I see. We could sing these songs and these would fill us with the spirit and they would help us to glorify God in our lives. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. He said, Let the word of God dwell, the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. <laughs> you know, we're to teach and we're to admonish one another, not just by the preaching of the word of God, but you know, the, 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 the hymns and the psalms and the spiritual songs that we sing, that we write, that we sing to ourselves, that we sing to one another. You know, these things admonish us as well. And we should never just think that the song service, that that portion of it is just, you know, something we just get out of the way before the preaching. You know, we just sing a few songs just to kind of warm up, you know, and give Brother Corbin a chance to collect his thoughts to figure out what he's going to say tonight. You know, that's, that's not what it is, you know. It's not because we all want to come here and hear this guy sing. We know that's true. You go ahead and amen that, right? But... You know, we sing those songs before the service because we're trying to remind ourselves of why we're here and who it is that we're worshiping and, you know, and who we are in Christ and so on and so forth. All these things that we do, they admonish us. And you know what? You don't have to limit yourself to just, you know, twice a week or three times a week if you make all the services. You, don't, you, can, you can do that every single day of your life. You could just sing a psalm. You could sing a, a hymn. You could sing a spiritual song. You know, you could listen to it. You know, one of the great things, I, one of the things I really like doing is around the Christmas season, like we just went through, is, you know, I listen to the Christmas, you know, with all the different Christmas carols, not the worldly ones that you hear out there, you know, Jingle Bell Rock. And my son was out back singing Jingle Bells, and you know, I didn't rebuke him, but I was like, man, where did he pick up? And he didn't learn that in my house, Jingle Bells. <laughs> I was like, I was thinking... <laughs> you're not a heathen. Why are you singing like that? <laughs> jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. 
pretty harmless. But you know, I like to I like to listen to the the, the good stuff. You know, the, the ones that remind me of the birth of Christ and so on and so forth. And that really puts me, you know, in the Christmas spirit. You know, and and without those songs, I don't know that that Christmas would be as special as it is to me. I mean, there's certain so I mean. You know, let me just go ahead and, and, con and confess to you that I have a heart, you know, and that when I, from time to time I hear something or, you know, that moves me, you know, I experience emotions just like anybody else, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that sometimes there's certain songs that, man, I, they choke me up. I, I mean, I remember I, there's been, you know, where I'm sitting down to sing songs in the church service and like I, I have to stop singing and just try to keep it together because I'm just so moved by the words that are in that song. And I'm so admonished by them. And Christmas songs are, you know, if you want to hit me, it's the Christmas songs. Oh, Holy Night. I mean, I'm just a blubbering, you know, sobbing just mess. <laughs> but those are, you know, there's some of those songs that just, man, just reminds you the lowly birth of Christ and so on and so on. We just went through Christmas. We know all about it. But, you know, that's a good example of the way songs, and, you know, hymns and psalms, man, they can really move us. And, and, and here's the thing, again, if, if you're wasting that, that, that power on just the trash music of the world, you know, and even the world, some of the world's music has, can definitely make us feel emotions and things like that, you know, but, and they understand that, but man, are they going to move you to worship Christ? Are they going to move you to be, to have, to have feelings and emotions that, that want to make you draw closer to God? I, I, I don't think so. You know, they're, they're not going to do that. So don't waste it on that stuff. Wasting it, you know, don't waste the, the this gift of music, the time that we have to just, you know, turn on the radio and listen to whatever comes across the airwaves. You know, listen to the, the songs, the hymns, the spiritual songs, and sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And it's interesting there again, you know, he says in Colossians to sing to one another in Psalms, a book that admonishes you to use musical instruments to worship God. Okay, so then, so some people would have us to believe that yes, we should we should sing the psalms, but those all that stuff about musical instruments that's a no no now because you don't see it in the New Testament. You know, well that's an, that's called an argument from silence. It's it's a logical fallacy. You can't just say, well, the Bible you know doesn't say in the New Testament. Well, does God have to repeat everything right. in the New Testament that He just got done saying in the Old Testament? It's a pretty thick book as it is. You know, you get through the Old Testament. It's like, all right, on to the new. You know, you're, you, the, the Old Testament's quite a bit bigger. I would, I, we don't need to add more to the, to, you know, have, you know, they would have us to read the Old Testament again with addition to everything that's in the New Testament. You know, just to clarify again everything that God, God just got done saying. Let's go ahead and say it all again. That's not how God works. You know, He said, hey, use the string instruments, use the cymbal, use the high sounding brass, use all these instruments to praise me in the Old Testament. He doesn't need to be redundant and repeat it in the New. So it's a foolish doctrine. And it's unfortunate because, you know, it, it, it robs people from being able to, you know, really fully worship God. You know, and hear the, the, all, I mean, music is such a great thing that God has given us. You know, all these different instruments that we've learned to create, to use, to glorify God. So, that's just, have we even gotten into the first verse here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think we did. No, we didn't. <laughs> We just got through the title of Psalms. Okay. So, and we're going to talk some more about the title. Because the title is actually pretty interesting to me. I thought this was probably one of some pretty interesting stuff. He says there, the uh, Shigion of David, which he sang unto the Lord, concerning the words of Cush the Benjamite. You know, whenever I've read that, I've read Cush the Benjamite. And I'm, I'm looking him up. I can't find him. And I say, okay, next time through, I'm looking for that Cush guy. Next time I'm reading through my Bible, I'm finding out who this is. And I've never been able to find Cush the Benjamite. And, and I don't, I don't, maybe somebody else has, and if you could show me where this guy, I would love it, you know, because I've read and I've looked and I've gone through and said, I'm finding it. Where is he? But uh, I don't think he's in there. A lot of, and I've, and I've looked this up. A lot of other people agree with that, you know, that Kush, should, he's just alluding to this guy. We don't know exactly what it was said, what, what it is, the words of uh, his words were. But from the context of the psalm and some other details about Kush that we are given here in this title, that he was a Benjamite. You know, it's a pretty logical conclusion that he was a somebody who was sympathetic to Saul and an enemy of David and slandered David. And that's kind of the nature of the psalm. This is David defending himself against the words of Cush the Benjamite and praying a prayer for Cush. Okay? 
So the words of Cush, um, you know, who was likely a relative of Saul, who sided against David. And, you know, you get that because they're both, one, they're both Benjamites. Saul was a Benjamite. Cush is a Benjamite. They're of the same household. And further, his words were, I believe, slanderous of David. And maybe that's why we don't know what he said. Because, you know, the words of a slander aren't really worth noting. You know, when you hear somebody uttering a slander, you know, it, it, that's, it's pretty much worthless. All you, all you really take note of is the fact that that person is a slanderer. And it's only a matter of time before they just, you know, just go off railing again. They're, it's not really worth, you know, well, what, exa how, what exactly did he say? What slanderous lie did he say about the man of God? Let's make sure we get that written down. That's probably why it's excluded from Scripture. That's probably why Cush, besides this mention, is just completely left out of the Bible. The only mention he got was the fact that, you know, he was a Benjamite, and he was a slanderer of David. <clears throat> if you look there in verse 1, let's get into it finally. He says, O Lord my God, indeed do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces. Now, who is the he there? This is talking about Saul. All these psalms are written where David is on the run from Saul. While there is none to deliver. Verse 3, O Lord my God, if I have done this, Done what? Well, it's concerning the words of Cush the Benjamite. If I have done, so basically he's saying, if I've done what this guy said I've done, then, you know, there, and if there be iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Verse 5, let him tread down my life upon the, the earth and lay my honor to, in the dust, Selah. So he's saying, look, if I've done what Cush the Benjamite has said that I've done, you know what? Then go ahead and persecute me. Go ahead and let him tread down my life upon the earth. You know what? I deserve what's coming if I said, if I've done what Cush the Benjamite said I have done. And what was what was said of, uh, of David by Cush the Benjamite? He said in verse 4, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me. He's saying, look, if I've done evil towards Saul, who was at peace with me, I mean, he was at one time at peace with him. You know, if I've rendered evil for evil, then you know what? Then let every then the, the, the persecute me. Punish me, Lord. That's what he's saying here. But he says there in that parentheses of verse 4, Yea, I have delivered him with uh, uh, that without cause is mine enemy. Now, was Saul David's enemy without cause? Yes. You know, da da Saul had no reason to persecute David. It was all, and we're going through 1 Samuel. We've been going through it, so we all know the story. That Saul has been just pursuing David because of the fact that he doesn't want to lose his position and his power. He has no justify, he has no justification for chasing David like he is. And David says, I have delivered him that without cause is my enemy. You know, we just read about that in, in 1 Samuel chapter 24, where David finds him in the cave alone and has the opportunity to go and kill him and cuts off just the skirt of his robe and then, you know, confronts him outside the cave and shows him, here's the skirt. I could have, you know, I could have had you. And lets him go free, and and so this whatever Saul, whatever Cush the Benjamite is saying, it's it's contrary to what David has actually done. He's saying actually, David, you know, David is rewarding evil to Saul. He's persecuting Saul. He's making Saul into the victim, and David into the aggressor, which is completely backwards. He's a slanderer because he's he's uttering something that is false. And David, you know, he's just committing himself to God, just saying, you know what? If what he says is true, then go ahead and let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor in the dust. Selah. And he was able to pray that prayer because he, know, he knew it wasn't true. And he, let me just, you know, we'll just talk a minute about slander because I believe that's what the words of Cush the Benjamin, Benjamite are. Him just saying things falsely against David break him harm. And, you know, slander is a very dangerous thing to do. And this is one of those words that just kind of get thrown around today. You know, people say, oh, you're railing, you're a railer, you know, you're slandering somebody. And, and, you, and even that accusation in of itself often can be a slander, which is kind of ironic. But slander is a very dangerous thing to do because when you're slandering somebody, basically you're speaking falsely of someone to harm their reputation or to bring, you know, evil upon them. And, and let me clarify what slander is not. Slander is not being mistaken. Okay, slander is not being mistaken by knowingly saying, uh, but it, it, rather it's knowingly saying what is false. You know, sometimes a person will just look at a situation 
and look at all the evidence and come to a conclusion and say, this is what I think happened, this is what I think so-and-so did, and this is what I think so-and-so is guilty of, and you look at all the information and you think, yeah, I can see how you arrive at that conclusion, and in all likelihood, that's what happened. That's not slander. And if it's found out later that that person wrong, that's actually just being called being mistaken. Slander is like, I know this isn't true. Like Cush the Benjamite. I know that, that David's not the one that's persecuting Saul. It's the other way around. But I'm going to go ahead and say it my way. I'm going to go ahead and tell it the other way around. Slander is when you're saying something that is false and you know it. And the only reason why you're saying it is to try to get somebody, you know, bring harm upon somebody's reputation. Or in David's case, you know, their very life. You know, slandering somebody to the point where, you know, someone would actually bring bodily harm to him. Slander is saying something that you know is false and saying it anyway. It's not being mistaken about, you know, things that appear to be a certain way. <clears throat> if you would, go over to uh, Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10. I'll, I'll, I'll show this in the scripture. If you're going to Proverbs chapter 10. I'll remind us of the story of Numbers 14 where, you know, they were counting uh, when, the, when they sent the spies into the land and the, and the evil report came back, right? It says, I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up, up, up a slander upon the land. So these ten spies that came back, you know, the twelve that came back, and the ten that were bad, they brought an evil report, but the, he's saying here that what they actually brought back was a slander upon the land. And they were, they were saying things that were, were, you know, false, or they were trying to get the people to believe something about that land that wasn't true. And what was one of the things that they said? Is that the giants were there, and that we were, you know, as grasshoppers in their sight, and that, that we just, there's just no way we can take the land. They're, they're bringing a slander upon it. They're saying things which are false. Why? To... You know, to discourage the people to believe something that wasn't true. Okay, I think Proverbs chapter ten is a very a much clearer definition. He says in verse eighteen, "He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander, is a fool." I don't think those are two different things. I think the the, the lying lips and the slander are talking about the same thing. When you are when you are uh, you know hiding hatred with lying lips. You know, think about what you're trying to do. You're trying to, if you're slandering somebody, you're lying about them, it's because you hate that person. And you're trying to bring harm upon them. He that hideth hatred with lying lips and lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. You know, uttering slander is a foolish thing to do. Because nine times out of ten, people are going to find out the truth. And they're going to understand that, oh, everything you just said was a complete and utter lie. And the only reason you said it is because you were just trying to harm somebody and, and damage their reputation. <clears throat> you know, and, and, and it's important that we understand it because and, and it's more specifically how dangerous it is to do this type of thing. Because it backfires on people, as we're going to see here. You know, it backfired on Christian Benjamite. You know, he slandered David, and David prayed a prayer for him. And David made some requests to God concerning Cush the Benjamite, and it wasn't pretty. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people that utter a, you know, utter a slander, you know, it comes back on them. You know, and, and we've seen that with our own pastor, you know, Pastor Anderson. I've seen people slander him and just say things. You know, like, what's the most recent one? One of the or just dumbest ones I've ever heard is, oh, Pastor Anderson, he's, you know, he's just gone ecumenical. Pastor Anderson is ecumenical. I you know I heard a couple preachers say that, and I'm just thinking... One, you, you, you must not understand what ecumenical means. Or two, you're uttering a slander and you're a fool. It's one of those. And it's just amazing to me that the same people that have said that have just come out as preaching just some of the most rankest heresy you'll ever hear concerning hell and so on and so forth. You know, and if you follow the preaching that goes on in Tempe, you know what I'm talking about. And it's, it's, a, it's a subject that's already been covered. You know, ad nauseum, I'm not going to go in it tonight. But it just goes to show you that people that come out and just start uttering slanders against the man of God, you know, a lot of times it comes back on their head. They get exposed as being, you know, blasphemers, or just believing stupid false doctrine, or everything. You know, I mean, to sit there and say that Pastor Anderson is ecumenical, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Like, where would you even get that? Oh, well, you know, he made, he made a film when he had a, 
we made that film and the guy was a Calvinist, you know, and that guy is unsaved. And then the guy turns around and says, but you know, unsaved people are some of the best soul winners. <laughs> and Judas was a superstore soul winner. I know he wasn't saved, so, so what's the problem here? And, you know, I'm confused now. It's okay for Judas to be, you know, that Jesus pal around with, with Judas, you know, and, and all of a sudden he's some great soul winner, but, you know, Pastor Anderson goes soul winning with some Calvinist who believes the right gospel, believes the King James Bible, and is trying to have an influence in another sphere, which is working, by the way. Those people are, you know, a lot of that, that crowd is coming around and have become King James only. Isn't that a good thing? Amen. Isn't that a good thing when people are abandoning false Bible versions and, and, and coming back to the King James Bible? Amen. You go, well, they got all this wrong doctrine. Well, what's going to fix their right doctrine or the wrong doctrine? It's this book when they get out these false versions. So what's the harm in trying to have some influence on, on somebody, especially when he's got up and said, they're never going to preach in my pulpit. I'm never going to preach in their pulpit. I don't recommend their church. I don't believe this about what they say. I believe they're wrong about this. But you know what? I believe they're saved. I believe they love the Lord. And I believe that they'll come back around if we can get them on the, on the King James Bible. And that's what's happened. So how is that ecumenical? How is that compromising it's, you know, for the sake of unity? That's not at all what's taking place. And the people that have uttered that slander today are being exposed as heretics. Yeah. Saying things like, oh, you know, uh, uh, unsaved people can get, sa get people saved. You don't need the Bible to get people saved. Or you, can just, you can just read the Bible and get saved. You don't need another so that, that's That's wrong. Yeah. You know, and, and I would encourage you to go listen to the sermons that have been preached in Tempe recently from, by Pastor Anderson to get a clear understanding if you're struggling with that. But I couldn't help but think about that. As I'm so you're, you know, reading about a guy like Cush who just utters a slander against David and then just has a you know, backfire on him. And it's supposed to show you that you know, being a slanderer really does make you a fool because it's a dangerous thing. Anytime you see anybody doing something very dangerous, it's usually foolish. You'd say, that, guy, that guy's kind of dumb. That guy's kind of stupid. <clears throat> Let's move on in the Psalms here. It says in Psalm 6, Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. So now David, he's going he's gonna to have some things to say now. He's going to go ahead and respond. Not to Cush. He's going to take it to the Lord. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Not, this isn't a blessing he's praying upon this guy. Lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies. And awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. You know, if I'm Cush, if I'm the enemy of David, I, that's, a, that's a prayer I don't want to hear him praying. I'm hoping and praying and saying, I hope God doesn't listen to that. Boy, I really hope God that, that David doesn't have uh, God's ear. But the Bible says that the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And we know that David was heard of God. It's a scary thing to have a man of God pray that about you. I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of this prayer. So what, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to keep myself away from slander. And I'm not going to make myself an enemy of God's people. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and await for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about. For uh, their sakes, therefore, return thou on high. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, and according to my integrity that is in me. You know, that's that's a that's a quite the prayer, too. I mean, he's saying in there in verse 8, judge me, O Lord. How, how many times would we pray that? Can we get up and pray that tonight? Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness. And according to my integrity that is in me. Now, I believe he's applying it specifically to this situation. He's saying, look, Lord, you know all the facts about this case. You know all the facts about whether or not I've been saying these things that Cush the Benjamite or doing these things that Cush the Benjamite is saying about me. You know all the facts about whether I've rewarded evil against him or not. So why don't you judge me, Lord? You know, he's taking the Lord and saying, according to my righteousness and according to my integrities. You know, only someone who is right with God can pray that way. Right. Only someone who's on the right side. Cush the Benjamite didn't pray this prayer. Well, at least I hope not for his sake. Because God's like, oh, I'll answer that and just bring the hammer down on you. Only someone like that who is right with God can pray that way. And what's, you know, especially, you know, concerning if you're the enemy of David at that point, is that they get God on their side. <clears throat> and again, it all goes back to the fact that it is a dangerous thing to slander or do harm to God's servants. 
And, you know, I thought of, you know, what are some other examples? And I thought about Herod, King Herod. And remember King Herod, who had John the Baptist beheaded? Yeah. I thought he was a really, uh, you know, great example of somebody who made himself an enemy of God's people and then was judged harshly by, by God. It's in Acts 11, you know, um, we won't go there for the sake of time. Well, actually, you know what? Let's go there. Let's go to Acts 11 and read the story. You know, and, and of course, I'm applying this to David, and I'm using examples about, you know, men of God and things like that. But, you know, this applies to anybody who's a child of God. You know, if you're born again, if you're saved, you know, you can apply this to you. You have God's ear just as much as anybody else. You have access to the throne of grace, just like anybody else. You can come boldly before the throne of grace, yeah. and and if somebody's you know slandering you or you know speaking evil of you, you can pray this prayer too. You can get God's ear. This is all available to you as well as God's people. But I think it's a dangerous thing when you're when you're going to slander somebody for especially somebody who has a very profound influence for the Lord. You know, and people people say, well, you're crazy to think that just because, you know, so-and-so or somebody slandered Pastor Anderson and now God is vexing them, or God is exposing them, or God has given them madness or taken away their understanding. And, I'll, you know, and you say, well, that, because, I mean, after all, who's Pastor Anderson? And and I under, and here's the thing, and don't get me wrong, amen to that. Who is Pastor Anderson? And he'd be the first to say it. Just another man. Just another just a man who loves the Lord and reads the Bible, well, he cannot deny the fact that he has had a profound influence for the Lord. Right. I mean, how? I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to say millions of people have been saved through this ministry. I mean, you say, well, where are all they? Uh, across the globe. All over the world. I mean, if, if anything, and just consider the fact that, you know, the people that have gotten saved through this ministry are getting other people saved. That 200 people in the bulletin, that all goes back to Pastor Anderson, who started this church down here, sent me down here to lead it. And so is it really that far-fetched to say that if someone's going to slander somebody who has that profound an influence for the gospel of Jesus Christ, is, is going to you know incur God's wrath upon their life? I don't think it's a stretch at all. And that's what I keep seeing time and time and time again. These people that come out, utter lies, slander, attack, things happen to them. And a lot of times it's very public. I'm thinking another group of people that attacked our pastor, our church recently, had you know terrible thing happen to their child. And I can't think, and, and, and I'm not rejoicing over that. I'm not happy about it. I wish it never had to happen. I'm just saying it's dangerous to slander the man of God. That's all I'm saying tonight. And we should not, you know, and if we ever get out of sorts with, with our pastor or with this church or whatever, you know, the best thing to do is just go quietly. Just go quietly and go serve God somewhere else. You know that's possible to serve God in other churches? Without having to attack the man of God or attack his family, you know. And, and I guess I get a, I wasn't really planning on going here. I guess I get a little worked up because of the fact that I'm just sick and tired of seeing it. And I've seen the effect that it's had on his family. Just to see him be attacked over again and again and again and again. To be bringing their kids into things and stuff like that. It's low. And God repays these people. And I can't think of anything scarier than something happening to my children. You know, like I was talking about this morning, I thought about, you know, uh, well, I wouldn't even go there. It's just a silly, stupid example. But these things, you know, people slander a man of God. And I'm not saying it's because... You know, he's Stephen Anderson. I'm saying it's because he's Pastor Stephen Anderson who has done a great work for God in these last days and has had a tremendous influence for the Christ. That's why it's a dangerous thing to slander somebody who has that kind of influence. And when that happens, when people do that, it just when you see things happen in their life, and they, and they still don't connect the dots. They still can't, they can't go, oh, you know, if you... A few months ago, I was railing on the man of God, and I was trying to stir up and split a church. And now, all of a sudden, this happens to my kid, and they're just like, well, praise God that everything turned out okay at the end. Cracked skulls, and I mean, it was terrible. In the hospital, didn't know you are going to make it out of there. I mean, and they still cannot put the dots together. Let me connect the dots for you. Because this is what's, I mean, that's what David prayed. Hey, this guy slanders him, and he says, arise, O Lord. And he says, get angry, get mad, God, and, and, and avenge me. 
Because, you know, David had an influence too. <clears throat> and what I love about it is that it, it, it goes back to the thing that, you know, we don't have to take things into our own hands. We can just let, and you know, if God decides to leave our enemies alone and let them and not punish them, so be it. And that happens too. I'm not saying everybody that's ever, you know, had some nasty thing to say about some preacher somewhere or whatever, you know, is going to have some terrible thing to happen to them. And God is very merciful. But when it does happen to somebody, just mark it down. That person must have been extra wicked for God to go ahead and just do something in their life. <clears throat> it's a dangerous thing to slander a man of God. It's a dangerous thing to do harm to any of God's servants. Because, I mean, think about how valuable any one of you are, any one of us. If we're reading our Bibles, raising our families for God, knocking on doors, getting souls saved. You know what? That, how many people are out there like that? I mean, I mean, are, are they just on every corner? How many people have come to your door with the, with the real gospel, with the King James Bible in hand? It's never happened to me, ever. You know, you're, you're a special, you're a rare breed tonight if you're God's servant. And it's a dangerous thing for somebody else to try to do you harm. Look at Acts 11, verse 1. That says in verse 1, Now about this time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. So he's not just going after the man of God. He's going after the whole church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because it saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So you got Herod. He's, you know, he's killing, he's vexing the church. He goes so far as to kill James. Then he says, I'm going to take Peter too because it makes the Jews happy. Look at verse 18. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir about among the soldiers that was become of Peter. We all know the story. Peter's in jail between the two centurions. The angel shows up, and it says he smote him and told him to get up. I mean, he's, I, mean I love that story. I'm just mentioning it because it's funny. He, I believe the angel kicked him. When you read that story, it says he was laying and he smote him. And he said, get up, arise. And, you know, he tells him to get up. Wake up, Peter. And he escapes. You know, he leads him out, and Peter goes back to the brethren. And, of course, the next day, there's no salt stir among the soldiers, what was become of Peter. When Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded they should be put to death. And, when the, uh, and he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and there abode, and Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, having made Blastus king of the Chamberlain, their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. Now, here's the point I want to make here. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. So he's given his, you know, State of the Union, you know, his, his big speech. And verse 22, and immediately, and the people gave a shout, saying, it is the voice of God and not of man. And I just, every time I read this, I think about when Obama was running for president. I think it was the first time. I don't know if anyone remembers this. But they, the people were saying, listen to the way he sets up his, his speakers. In the speech, like he had like this deep reverb to give him like a divine sounding voice. Because you know, like, you think like, the, like when people try to do like when God's talking, it's like this big, blah, 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 blah. it's like kind of echoey and it's deep and it has bass. And they're like, listen to the way Obama sets up his speech. It was totally different than a typical, it was not quality sound, but you could tell he was trying to make it sound like he was divine or something. Or maybe just the sound guy didn't know what he was doing. It turned out that way. But I always think about that. People hearing some politician get up like, it's the voice of God. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. You know? anyway. And it says, the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not the God the glory and was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. What a great story. <laughs> Read your Bible, folks. There's some cool stuff in there. I mean, that because you know this really happened. If you believe the Bible, that happened. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now, people will speculate. Did it happen right then? I believe it was just like instantaneous. You know, like the, just it's like some scene out of a movie or something. Or maybe like he got a worm and then like slowly was eaten over time. But I believe it was just like right then. Just people, like the people there are like, you know, watching this happen and just being devoured by these worms. He, and then they were like, well, it turns out it wasn't God. <laughs> and God said, actually, he's not God. Let me prove it. You know, worms, you know, and, and he gets eaten. Right? Now, you say, well, it's because he didn't give God the glory. Yeah, but he was kind of on a bad trajectory there. 
You know, and maybe if he hadn't already persecuted the church and killed James and was looking to do the same thing to Peter, you know, maybe God would have let that slide. Maybe God would have been like, eh. But I believe he's like, okay, that's enough. You know, you're you're attacking my people. You're you're not giving me the glory. It's you know what? It's worm food, buddy. Literally. <clears throat> and you know, I think he was just shown no mercy, and he was made an example because of the fact that he was one that was not afraid to attack God's people. Now, of course, he wasn't slandering anybody. But I'm just using this as an example of the fact that look, it's a it's dangerous to attack God's servants. You know, it, and the greater the influence they have, probably the more dangerous it is, I believe. And, you know, slander is a form of attack. That's what it is. It's not just being mistaken about something or coming to a wrong conclusion, like some people want to have you believe. It's when you're actively going out and promoting what you know to be a lie to bring harm. That's an attack. <clears throat> it's a dangerous thing to do to attack God's people in any way. And he was shown that so Herod here, he gets no mercy and he gets made an example of. And that's what happens to people who attack God's servants. You know, I haven't seen anybody get eaten of worms. But I've seen I've seen preachers start to say some things that, that are just completely off base. And it's like, are you saved? Or is God just, you know, giving you confusion and confounding you? Or, you know, some people attack the man of God and then something horrible happens in their life. And it's like, was that God? And it wouldn't surprise me if it was. I mean, God's willing to just dump, you know, have a guy eating the worms in front of everybody. A king like that. I mean, why wouldn't he do it to, you know, similar things to other people? I mean, he chastens his own children. You know, every you know, there's no son to be chasing it not. Go read Hebrews 12. Even we, you know, I mean, don't, I don't think you have to worry about worms. <laughs> You know, but if we get out of sorts with God, He chastens us. You know, He works on us. How much more so is He going to work on somebody who's actively trying to attack one of His servants? And again, you're one of them tonight. You know, if you're serving God, if you're living for the Lord, you know, that, that protection is, is promised to you. That's not saying you're never going to be attacked. It's just saying that God will avenge His, 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 his children. He'll protect them, and He will, uh, you know, Repay, say the Lord. <clears throat> and so David here, you know, he's being slandered, he's being attacked, and it, it moves him to prayer. You know, and, and and David went into his prayer closet and just prayed the sweetest little prayer for Cush the Benjamite and just asked blessings and peace upon him. No, he went in there and asked God to get angry, to get mad. Look at verse 9. You're still there in, in Psalms chapter 7. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. He's not saying, well, let them get right with God. He's saying, cut them off. Kill them. Get rid of them. Let the wickedness of the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. But establish the just, for the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. He's saying God knows who's right in a situation. And that's the beautiful thing about being right. Is that you don't have to prove that to anybody but God. And you don't have to prove it to him. He already knows. You don't have to go on social media and defend yourself. You don't have to, you know, just keep going back and forth with some railer, some slanderer to try and clear your name. You know what? You can just let God deal with it. Because God try at the hearts and the reins. God knows who's right and who's wrong in these situations. And he said in verse 10, My defense is of David is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. So we should try to be like David, I, I believe. That's he's a, he's a good example. And you know, so is Christ. You know, Jesus was also one who was slandered. He was one that was had a false report brought upon him, that was lied about. Remember when they were trying to get him executed, they couldn't even get the false witnesses to agree. And they were just trying to make something stick. And eventually it just came down to having to just, you know, basically kind of threaten Pilate. You know, it, you know if you don't kill this guy, you know, you call him the king, you're no friend of Caesar, you know, threatening him with a job and, you know, losing his job punishment. And he's like, all right, yeah, you guys see to it then. <clears throat> you know, Jesus was one who was suffered, you know, being railed against in false accusations and slandered. And so was David. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. You know, and that's what David is doing in this psalm. Because again, this is, you know, 
This is Shigayan or whatever, you know, the, the, the prayer of David. It's a, it's a prayer that was sung to God. This wasn't David's, you know, personal response to Cush the Benjamite. This wasn't an open letter to Cush, you know, Saul's cousin or whatever. This was God, this was David committing himself to him that judgeth righteously. You know, I don't know that David ever said anything of this nature directly to Cush. Came up to him and said, hey, I just want to know, this is what I think, and this is what I prayed the other night. You know, he probably just heard what was being said, went to God, prayed it, and left it in his hands, and just committed himself to him that judges righteously. Just committed himself to him which trieth the hearts and reigns, and knows who's right, knows who's wrong, and who know, and knows how to pay back God, uh, the enemies of God and his people. <laughs> you know, and there's nothing wrong with asking God to take action. I don't think David's wrong for having prayed this, saying, you know, get angry, rise up, let the wicked come to an end. That's a good prayer. But don't don't we want the wickedness to stop? Don't we want the wicked to come to an end? That's a good prayer. You know, we were talking earlier about how we should pray the Psalms. Maybe we should sing this one. You know, I don't know how to write any music, but that would be a good one. Let the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, the just, the righteous God, try to reign hearts and reigns. You know, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let those also that hate him flee before him. That's a good prayer. There's nothing wrong with asking God to take action. Because, and what's scary about this for guys in Cush's position, these slanderers, is that God listens and God is not passive. God just doesn't hear David and go, calm down. Don't you think you're overreacting a little bit, David? Well, you should. That wasn't nice. Look at verse 12. It says, if he turn not, he will wet his sword. You know, wet, like a wet stone. And God's just up there, shh, shh, just sharpening that sword, like, oh, it's going down. It's getting ready, right? He hath bent his bow. He hath made it ready. I mean, God's, like, getting ready to, you know, dole out a whooping. He also hath prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordained his arrows against the persecutors. God, you know, the scary thing about David's prayer is that God hears it and takes action. I would love to know what became of Cush the Benjamite. We're going to find out. We probably already know if we read, you know, is, is what came of Saul. And did, what did, David didn't even pray against Saul. And God went ahead and did that for him anyway. God went ahead and just let Saul come to his end. I believe that Cush got what was coming to him. Look at verse 14. Behold, he, and I believe the he there is he's referring back to this guy, Cush. Because remember, that's the context. This is concerning the words of Cush the Benjamite. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived mischief, and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and digged it. That's what you're doing when you're slandering. You're bringing forth falsehood. You're digging a pit, and you're trying to get somebody else to fall in it. He made a pit and digged it, and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his own violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. Now, pate there is just an old-fashioned word for head. That's what that means. He's saying, look, it's, it's all going to come back on you, Kush. All the violent dealing, all the slander, all the harm you're trying to bring to God's man, all the harm you're trying to bring to God's servants is going to come back upon you. And you know what? We can kind of rest in that. You know, when we have people that are trying to do us harm because of the fact that we love the Lord, we want to serve God, and they're out there, you know, these sodomites hate God, and they hate, you know, they're despisers of those that are good. And don't ever let it surprise you if one day we have our own protest here, just like they've, they've got out in FWBCLA, you know, First Church Baptist over there. They were out, you know, I'm watching social media, they're showing up today. I was up in... You know, uh, Vancouver, Washington, this last fall, sodomites protesting outside the church because somebody had the audacity to go to their house and leave an invite on their door. And the invite said, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. Ah! <laughs> Protest! You think that's really what they're mad about? They're, they're, what they're really mad about is they know that the Bible condemns their filthy lifestyle yeah, man. And, and, and it says that it's worthy of death. And they, you know what? If you didn't believe that, if, if you just were, if there's, and this is what just blows my mind, if they're just so dismissive of the Word of God and don't believe it, why does it bother them so much? Why does it bother you so much if there's people out there that believe it? If we're just a bunch of backwards Baptists, just a bunch of 
stupid bumpkins who believe in some old fairy tale, fairy tale leave us to our ignorance and go about your life. Because after all, you believe this is the only one you got. Why are you wasting your time protesting a bunch of, you know, ignorant morons who live a Bronze Age book, in your opinion? Because you know what? In the back of their minds, they know it's true. They know everything that's being preached out of the Word of God is absolutely true. That it describes them to a team. It describes them as the vile, filthy reprobates they are. And that they've got everything that's coming to them that the Bible says. Fiery indignation, the wrath of God for all eternity upon them. And it drives them crazy. And if they can get, you know, a servant, they can get a preacher, they can get a church to back down and say, oh, we're sorry, maybe that will soothe their conscience a little bit. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> but you know what? It's all going to come upon their own head. Their, their own violent dealings should come upon their own head. And maybe not in this life. But we can be like David, and we can go to a God who is not passive, and who hears his, the prayers of his servants, and we can just take it to God and leave it there, and however God sees fit to deal with the enemies of the Lord on this earth is fine by me. And if he wants to let the wicked continue and evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, he has his own reasons. And if God allows persecution to continue to come and things get worse and, and our, we're not avenged immediately of our enemies, so be it. Like those, those, you know, those, those people that were persecuted in the, the tribulation saints in the book of Revelation. Oh, oh, oh Lord, not holy and true, how long is not avenge our blood upon the earth? And they said, you know, he said, yet a little while, you know, and, and you know, your brethren have to come. I'm paraphrasing, I'm butchering it, but he's saying, look, this had to happen. You had to be persecuted, and then I'm going to pour out my wrath. You know, God's day of vengeance is coming. And David prays this prayer. Right? You know, if people, you know, need to understand that this is a good prayer that he prayed. And he's praying against a guy. And this is how you handle conflict. Isn't this better than David just... Remember when we read about earlier, uh, last Thursday, when it came to... Uh, it's escaping me. Ah, what was his name? I'm, just, I'm forgetting it right now. You know where he's going up? Uh, Abigail's husband. Uh, ah. Abel. What was it? Nabal. Nabal. I want to say it was the end something. I'm sorry. Nabal, right, yeah. How he was going to avenge himself, and, and, and the Bible, and, and David realizes at the end that, that Abigail came and stopped him from doing evil, and he just left it in God's hands, and, 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 then he, and, and Nabal hears the news, and his heart turns to stone, and ten days later he dies, and David says, well, the Lord did it. You know, that was a lot better way of handling things, than just taking things into our own hands. You know, we should not uh, resist evil, the Bible says. We should give place to wrath. But that doesn't mean we can't go pray about it and ask God to do something about it. And David goes and prays this prayer. And then look at verse 17. He doesn't feel bad about it. He doesn't pray that prayer and go, oh, can't believe I said that. You know, man, it changed my heart. He says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. I sing praises to the name of the Most High God. He's not going to sit around and bite his nails about Cush the Benjamite and worry about what slanderous things being spoken about him now. He said, you know what? I'm just going to deal with this right now. I'm just going to pray this prayer and ask God to deal with the wicked. I'm going to ask him to, 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 to just deal with it according as he sees fit and just leave it with God. And then I'm just going to praise the Lord according to his righteousness and we'll sing praises to the name of the Lord Most High. That's a great way to handle it, isn't it? The beat's taken in your own hands. Or how about this, worrying about it all the time. And feeling like you just have to go out and, I mean, good night. If, 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 if men like Pastor Anderson had to go out and defend himself against every slanderous thing that's been said, I mean, that's a full-time job. You know, I get the voicemails and it's just like, you just, you, you know, Google Voice just, you know, tran puts it, uh, transcribes the, the voice into text. And it takes all the profanity out. So when I'm doing the voicemail, I just, oh, there's all those asterisks. Delete. And I'm saying people leave, you know, just they fill up the voice machine repeatedly. You'll count it up. It's like you spent 45 minutes on the phone just railing on the man of God, and he didn't hear a word of it. <laughs> but I tell you, I can tell you what he was doing that day. Like any of God's servants, praising the Lord Amen. for his righteousness, living his life, praising the name of the Most High God. You know, and we should never, because if the enemy can take that away from us, if they can get us to stop serving God, if they can get us to stop praising the Lord. You know, in a way, they've kind of won. 
And really, that's what they want to do at the very least. They can't stop us. They want to distract us and just get us involved in things and get us, you know, just, just spinning our wheels. I'd rather just do what David did. Just take it to God, leave it to him, and just trust that, you know, if God is one that will wet his sword, he will bend his bow, and he will, you know, he's prepared for him the instruments of death. <laughs> God will take care of it. We should just concern ourselves with praising God. And you know what? What's, what, what's one of the ways we can praise God? Through the psalms, the hymns, and the spiritual songs, Amen. right? To admonish ourselves and to, you know, and to sing these and make melody in our hearts unto the Lord. This would be great. This would be a great one to, to know, wouldn't it? Yeah. This is a good song right there. Let's 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 sing this one throughout the week. If we ever run ourselves, you know, run into a situation similar to David, you know where to turn, you know what to sing, you know what to pray. A psalm like this. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, again, thank you.